All right. Session seven, closing the network adequacy gap, telehealth to the rescue. We have with us Dr. Sarah Gibson with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona Health Choice, Jacob Harper, partner at Morgan Lewis, um, and Zach Snyder, Vice President of Government Affairs at Quest Analytics. Um, we welcome this panel today, and I would like you all to know that there's going to be a tabletop discussion. So after the presentations, we'll throw it over to you all to talk for a few minutes, and then we'll do Q&A. All right, and just as a reminder, everybody stand up so we can get you on video for those at home. Perfect. Uh, sounds good. So I'm uh, tired of talking. Um, I'm actually not. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I never believed you. But luckily, luckily, this topic I have no knowledge about, so uh, it's gonna it's gonna work out a lot better. Um, so we're gonna be talking about network adequacy, and in particular, the role of telehealth in network adequacy. And I'm gonna let Zach set the stage much better than I certainly can. But, but generally speaking, when we're thinking about this issue, the, conceptually, it is just about the requirements that various uh, federal and state health care plans have, um, and I guess commercial too, right? Commercial plans would have some kind of network capacity requirements under their state laws. Um, that, that <laughs> th thank you. Um, that basically, they have to have a certain number of providers within their network in order to uh, adequately meet the needs of the members that they are designated to care for. And telehealth can play a central role in that process because instead of having, you know, these geographically restricted provider networks, it enables the ability for, uh, for networks to be much more broad in terms of their catchment area and getting doctors and specialists from different places that they might historically not have, have got them from. So um, with that, uh, Zach, do you want to sort of walk through uh, the, the sort of the basics of network adequacy and, and those issues? Yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, so my name is Zach Snyder, and I'm Vice President of Government Affairs for Quest Analytics. And Quest Analytics is a provider data analytics company. And so what the hell does that mean? Well, one of the things that we do is we, we work on um, provider network adequacy and provider data accuracy issues. And so what we do is we have developed technology solutions for the payers, for our health plans, and actually for the government itself. So we have direct contracts with CMS, with state departments of insurance, with uh, state Medicaid agencies that regulate these health plans to help them measure and monitor whether or not the payers are meeting the requirements that, that you described. Are they meeting these network adequacy requirements? So what are network adequacy requirements? What do I mean? So these are the laws that require the health plans to ensure that the patients that are in their network have access to providers within certain quantitative metrics. And these vary based on the jurisdiction. So when, we, when we're talking about Medicaid, there are 50 states. Every state sets their own network adequacy requirements for Medicaid. In the same state, the same health plan offering on Medicaid could have totally different standards when it comes to what they offer small businesses and on the exchange because that is regulated by the Department of Insurance. The same health plan offering in the same state, offering Medicare Advantage plan, they have different standards because CMS sets those standards. Again, the same health plan, same state, maybe they, they uh, uh, offer military benefits. The VA sets those standards. So as you can see, the, the theme here is that these standards are different depending on the line of business that we're talking about. And these quantitative standards, what we call them, generally, now they vary, but they are time and distance standards. And these are requirements that require the health plans to ensure that they have uh, access to maybe a collection of provider specialty types within driving time distance that vary based on a county classification. So think about it like this. You, you talk about Byzantine, so these, these get very Byzantine <laughs> here. Um, <clears throat> what, what these governments do is they classify every county in the state. And generally, there's five classifications. So there's you know, a large metropolitan county, a micro county, a rural county, and then they identify a collection of provider specialty types that they believe are essential for the bare minimum network. So they'll identify maybe 40 to 45 provider specialty types, you know, podiatrists, cardiologists, and then they'll say, in a large metro county, you have to make sure that your members have access to a, uh, a PCP within five miles. 
So they, they have to ensure that. And before they can go out and sell these health insurance products, they have to prove to the government that they have that in place. And the government has to measure and monitor to ensure that they meet those requirements. So how does telehealth play into this? So these laws were written, you know, mostly about 30 years ago, you know, before telehealth was, you know, widely known about and widely used. Now it is much more widely known about and widely used, mostly because of the pandemic, like we're all talking about today. And so regulators are thinking about how can we incorporate telehealth into these network adequacy requirements? Because they're not incorporated today. Well, CMS was kind of the first mover on this. In Medicare Advantage in 2020, they told the Medicare Advantage plans, you can get a 10% credit on your requirements and network adequacy for a collection of provider specialty types. So for like 12 or 13 provider specialty types, you can get a 10% a credit on this. So that was, you know, that was really big because that was the first time where a government entity actually put into regulation uh, one of these credits. And so now lots of other uh, you know, states, state Medicaid agencies, state departments of insurance, uh, and other divisions within CMS, they're looking at adopting these, you know, uh, these credits that can be incorporated into the network adequacy law that would encourage the health plans to bring in more, uh, you know, telehealth providers into their networks. And so that's really interesting. You know, for example, CMS in its annual notice of benefit and payment parameters regulation, which uh, was recently released, um, actually just a few. I think just a few days ago now, uh, they are op openly contemplating adopting this for the federal exchange. There was a proposed rule that was issued uh, for Medicaid um, just a few months ago. And in, in, in that rule as well, they openly considered, hey, should we require states to adopt uh, a telehealth provision in their network adequacy laws? Uh, and then finally, the, the Department of Labor, which actually regulates the, the self-funded plans. So that's the, that's the part of the market where uh, the large employers offer plans. So CMS doesn't regulate those health plans. The Department of Labor does. They actually don't even have any network adequacy regulations in that market. And that's the biggest commercial market out there. They're, they're openly saying now, hey, we're considering adopting network adequacy, time and distance regulations. And oh, by the way, what should the role of telehealth be when we do adopt those or if we do adopt those? So that, that's kind of the trend we're seeing right now. And there's a lot of opportunity, especially at the federal level, to have an impact. Now at the state level, you have to go state by state. And the way that these network adequacy laws have been created by and large is actually through regulation. For example, uh, the uh, you know CMS they've adopted all of these um, very intricate time and distance network adequacy regulations, and they did that not because the Affordable Care Act has it in the statute you should do all of this. It, it's just a very broad requirement that health plans have sufficient networks. So CMS interprets that and they say, okay, that gives us the authority to do this, and we see the same, you know, something pretty similar in every state as well. Very broad state legislation gives these departments authority to implement these requirements. So in order to actually move this, this kind of policy forward, you wouldn't even necessarily need legislation. We've seen it done through regulation, notice and comment, you know, uh, APA style regulation. We've also seen it done through sub-regulatory -reg guidance as well. So you could get a lot done um, going into the states on, on this issue. So I don't want to take up too much time because I know we have some, some table talk here, but I did want to get into how, and I don't know if you want to get into that now, but how uh, different stakeholders have reacted to this policy because we might think like, hey, this is, a, this is a good idea. We should have policies that would encourage health plans to bring in more providers into their, you know, more telehealth providers into their network. So why, you know, why haven't, legislative bodies or regulatory bodies adopted this? Well, there's been a lot of pushback. It's actually been a pretty controversial uh, proposal. And uh, I wanted to share with you some reactions from different industry stakeholders. And maybe, I don't know if we want to get into it at the end, but we can do it now. Yeah. 
why don't, why don't you talk about that? And okay. Then, and then Dr. Gibson can talk about some of the experiences on the, on the actual plan. Yeah, okay. Plan. Right. Okay. So, when it comes to industry reactions, the, the provider industry, the American Medical Association, the American Hospital Association, whenever something like this has been proposed, they've been very strong in pushing back against this. Really, anything that they see that, that they would characterize as weakening network adequacy standards, they very strongly push back against that. And I, look, I have some quotes here that I thought was pretty interesting. So when CMS was proposing this, here's a reaction from the American Hospital Association. By, by automatically applying this 10% credit, CMS runs the risk of allowing insurers to dilute their market with virtual providers who may not actually have the capacity to take patients while simultaneously reducing their in-person footprint. Now here's, here's a position from how I would characterize them as advocates. So these are consumer advocacy groups that are very influential you know, at CMS, in Congress, in state legislatures. <clears throat> We urge CMS to study the telehealth credit system before adopting it for the exchange. We, we strongly support HHS, um, we strongly support the idea that telehealth cannot be offered in place of, tele, of in-person services. So there's this idea that, yeah, that's great. Off, you know, we wanna encourage health plans to offer telehealth, but do not create a policy that would allow the health plans to substitute their, uh, their requirements for time and distance bricks and mortar access with telehealth. That is what they're pushing back against here. What, what do you, there we go. What, what do you think those concerns are based on? Well, <clears throat> these, these concerns, I mean, what they say that these concerns are based on are all about market leverage, right? So the, you know, a lot of the provider, you know, what, what, the, um, what the trade associations are bringing forward is concerns from their membership, and their membership is saying to them, this decreases our market leverage in contract negotiations. Because when the, when the providers know that the health plan needs this provider to get network adequacy and actually start selling in the, in the market, then they can have a much stronger position in that negotiation. Now, when they don't need that provider to meet adequacy, then perhaps they don't have as much leverage. But, but in the concept where you have a, um, a, a patient advocacy group, right? wouldn't that work in reverse? That's obviously a very influential group, but I mean, wouldn't they be wanting to have generally lower prices and theoretically better access to different varieties of care? Is there a concern about we only want care that's sort of in an in-person you know, setting as opposed to virtual care options? Is that a distrust of telehealth as a modality of care? Uh, so from the, from the consumer advocacy perspective, they've, they're very rarely aligned with what the health insurance industry is pushing for. Then Surprising. This is what, yes. <laughs> so this is what the health insurance industry is, is pushing for. So they, they see it, for better or for worse, you know, there could be some education that's going on, but they see it, just like the providers see it, as a weakening of standards. They see it as, you're taking something away from me. I had bricks and mortar, you know, mm. yesterday. Now you're putting this new policy in place, and now I have less bricks and mortar. That's how they see it. Yeah. Kind of. But the health plans, they, of course, are very supportive of this. And the regulators themselves are, support, are supportive of it. So on, you know, on one side, you have the, you know, the providers and the consumer groups. The consumer groups, I would say, are skeptical. I wouldn't say that they're totally against it. Um, but you know, the AMA, their House of Delegates, just passed a resolution recently coming out forcefully against this. I mean, they're, they're all in. Uh, you know, saying, hey, no, no weakening of network adequacy standards. Great. Um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll have Dr. Gibson go next, and then I think we have a tabletop discussion, and then we'll do some, some Q&A. I'll move this down. <laughs> Slight height deferential. Okay. 
I've been doing network adequacy for 27 years with 100% of my medical care being over telemedicine. I'm a psychiatrist. My name is Sarah Gibson, and I have been the uh, psychiatrist for rural Apache County on the New Mexico-Arizona border and providing 100% of their network adequacy, which we call access to care, uh, for mental health um, over telemedicine uh, for 27 years since uh, my son was born in 1995. So um, there's a 10% we call it a cap in CMS uh, for network adequacy to be provided over telehealth. And that is a concept that was so foreign to me that I had no idea what these guys were talking about uh, two months ago. Um, because 100% of the mental health care is over telehealth in several of our counties. I also uh, work in administration uh, for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona, and so I oversee all of the telehealth um, in, the, in the state of Arizona. So I have kind of both caps on, in a sense. Um, and my statement to regulators and uh, policy makers is that, first of all, a 10% cap is meaningless in so many areas of the country, um, but especially in Arizona, and of course I talk rural because that's what we've been doing, 100% um, is a uh, is 100% of, or a 0% cap. We can't function with that kind of a cap or that kind of a regulation because we either have telehealth or we have no health care in some of our areas and especially in the areas that I've been practicing in. I'll give you an example. Uh, when we started doing telemedicine in uh, 96, uh, we were tasked with uh, overseeing two-thirds of the state of Arizona, but only 11% of the population, and that was in little pockets throughout. So for me to actually travel to the towns where I have been providing care uh, would be a seven-hour drive. I can see seven urgently needed psychiatric evaluations in that time and 14 follow-ups. And so it makes no sense for anybody to be traveling in this world um, that we live in now, especially in the mental health world, which is the region where I think we need to specifically restrict those caps. But, um, and, and I'm sure you've heard stories of, uh, we have a town called Supai. It's a village at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. It serves the Havasupai tribe. In order to get there, you have to drive on the freeway, then you take an hour on this horrible two-lane road, and then you hike, and I've done this, a heinous seven mile down switchbacks, and it's okay going down, but coming out. Um, so. Uh, in order to provide health care to these people, we were helicoptering in our mental health providers and our, um, and so obviously telehealth, what could be a better usage of our time and energy and money? But that counts in the 10% caps, so that doesn't quite make sense. Another example is the great town of Witch Wells, Arizona. Have you been there? Um, Witch Wells. Witch Wells. Witch Wells. Witch Wells. It's a... It's, there's a well, maybe two, and it's named after a witch? I don't know. But anyway, um, when they talk about distance and time for this cap, um, the state of Arizona, every state has their own caps and their own way that they interpret this. But the state of Arizona has a 10% cap, um, and it's based on distance in miles as well as time it takes. Well, which wells? It's only about 15 miles from St. John's, which is also very small uh, and has no local providers. Um, however, it's 15 miles of rutted dirt road that gets full in the monsoon season of mud and in the snow season it gets full of snow. So it's basically inaccessible. And telemedicine, telepsychiatry is how we have accessed care um, for this population. Um, the Colorado City, 
uh, which is another very small place on that Arizona Strip between uh, Arizona and Utah. Um, and it has uh, it characterized by very large families who are very spread out, very dispersed. And there is a brick and mortar clinic there, only primary care, in order to get specialists into that little brick and mortar place. And these families would drive in, they'd take a whole day of it because they have large families and they would uh, bring the whole family in, drive in, spend the whole day, hope to get all of their medical care taken care of for the year and then go away. Well, there's no specialists, there's no pediatric allergist, there's no endocrinologist. Um, and so, and mental health as well. So we would contract with the local hospital to provide all of that over telehealth uh, to a brick and mortar place. So the message is the 10% cap doesn't make sense. We have two major mental health crises. There's the opioid crisis, which we're all deeply aware of, and the uh, provision of suboxone buprenorphine for medication-assisted treatment of opioid use disorders is so important and is a major part of what I've been involved with in the past year. But I also, or past 15 years since heroin and fentanyl started flowing through the streets of Springerville, Arizona. But we also have um, issues with the seriously mentally ill and they're not being paid attention to. The elderly person who moved into our county um, on massive doses of Xanax with a severe anxiety disorder, multiple medical, medical problems, impoverished with her elderly husband in their trailer, and COVID hit, we couldn't, nobody would take care of this poor lady because they were terrified of her massive uh, Xanax uh, prescription, but it, you know, can you prescribe controlled substances over telehealth? Well, I needed to take care of her, so I did, and I, and I prescribed the Xanax. I helped her over the years to gradually decrease her dose and gradually make this to be a safe transition for her. In the meantime, she had a stroke, became unable to walk, was sent home to live with her husband in the trailer that she couldn't get out of because there were steps. Um, so I was seeing her weekly in her home over telemedicine, um, over telehealth. And so that's where these, um, yes, we need telehealth to be available, but we cannot be restrictive for the 10% uh, cap or use any sort of averages for um, many of the specialties that we need. So not only um, is telehealth versus no care an option, um, but also it's telehealth may be the best care or the only care that we have. Great, thank you, Dr. Gibson. So I think uh, we have a, uh, a table top question here. Oh, excuse me. And, uh, and let's see, that is, uh, uh, the question that Zach answered and Dr. Gibson answered. I'm just kidding. Um, but how can uh, telehealth play a crucial role in addressing network adequacy challenges? So why don't we take five minutes before we come back for some Q&A and just sort of talk amongst yourselves uh, about how the challenges that any of you have faced in, in trying to uh, you know, either get a contract or, uh, or otherwise have network, ad ad network adequacy caps and credits impact how you've been able to operationalize your your telehealth business? All right, folks, we're gonna um, we're gonna stop here. And uh, are there any examples that anyone wants to share? Uh, do we have the other mic? Do the mic? Yeah, grab the mic. So, any any examples that anyone wants to share of a network adequacy concern challenge? Anything? We got one right here. I don't have an example. Oh well, never mind then. <laughs> Is this on? Yep. yep. I guess our discussion is around, I understand the purpose way back when of network adequacy. You try to make sure you have enough physicians to handle the patients. Um, with the shortage of physicians and caregivers, and some of these specialists where you can't get in to see a physician for six months, I'm, I'm now trying to understand the purpose of network accuracy because it's not fulfilling that goal. So why not have telehealth to fulfill the goal? Should we change network accuracy to a different metric? 
So that was a discussion we had. That's a fantastic discussion. I think it's <laughs> Zach's point. It's all about the money and the leverage. Um, and, and that's probably what's impeding a lot of that. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts or any other discussion points? Mm -hmm. Michelle? Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, what was your question, Jake? I wasn't paying attention to you. No. <laughs> so the the only the only network advocacy situation I was mentioning here at the table is we had um, a scenario in California, which they have payment parity now, so it's a little different. But this was for Blue Cross. They paid for telehealth to be implemented across the state of um, California. Blue Cross did. Uh, in rural areas in particular because they wanted to prove that they had access to specialists and primary care providers so that they could sell policies. So they actually grant funded, real, real life scenario, grant funded Adventist Health across the, uh, across the state. So we were implementing telehealth in the Napa Valley and other rural areas in the north um, so that, and th at their cost, so that they could then sell policies to those people because they then would have coverage. So a little bit different. And the, and the other spin is we talked about South Carolina. Um, in South Carolina, we have no parity, um, no Medicaid expansion, and our commercial payers have said flatly that they're not going to pay uh, at parity. And their reasoning is that you don't have to buy tongue depressors and cotton balls, real words from them. And I've, my response was, yeah, you have to buy computers and <laughs> cameras. Um, but <laughs> a little bit more expensive. Um, but the, um, the point of their reasoning is not, not only uh, paying less because for that reason, but in addition, they're saying they are responding to their members who are saying they're providing telehealth services through like their little cards, right? Hey, you can use telehealth through Blue Cross, um, through Blue Cross providers who are probably Teladoc or whoever. Um, nothing against Teladoc, that's a business. But they are, in fact, uh, competing, but necessarily the discussion was they're competing with the health systems in the area, and their response to that is, no, we're actually addressing the needs of our members who are saying it's taking 90 to 120 days to get a primary care visit. So a very similar kind of point to your point, right? It's, you know, however you characterize it, and obviously different <laughs> folks have different incentives to characterize it differently, so. Yeah, we had kind of two points along that. Getting network adequacy by adding providers who don't have availability doesn't actually help, even though you can check the box with the state when you bring them on board. Um, that was actually, and then I forgot my second point because I was talking. That was a great first part. Yeah. Does that actually happen though? I mean, have you seen? Oh, a hundred percent. Because we can go in and add providers for that network adequacy, but they aren't accepting new patients. Right. Yeah. But then you also have some states that will put the requirements on for network adequacy. We've had it happen on the dental side where they asked for more dentists than existed in the state. So we were able to get that one worked with regulators, but it's like there's not that many belly buttons that practice in your state. So okay. yeah, just real quick. One other kind of point we talked about, though, that I think can't get lost is that, you know, the, maybe with the exception of mental health in some cases, but in most of our specialties that are doing a lot of telemedicine, they'll still agree that there are some visits that need to be done in person. And so yeah, I think the concern is a little bit understandable that if you, if you take away that leverage that the in-person providers have, do you end up losing even more of the providers that are really hard to recruit already to these rural areas? And so just entirely telehealth maybe isn't the answer either. You need to have some sort of hybrid. And so the telehealth providers, do they have some sort of option for an in-person option rather than just a arbitrary percentage? Maybe you can you know, try to answer it in that way. I, I think it was that line of thinking of why they settle on 10% is they... Well, I think it was that line of thinking is why they landed on 10% because they, they were, I think... Um, sympathetic to those concerns, and they just pulled a percentage out of the air, and they said 10% sounds like it's enough to, to throw them a bone. Yeah. Good round number. Yeah. yeah. But shouldn't there be some responsibility of a professional clinician to say, I know that I need to do this much of my care, and that that's not for regulators to decide? 
you know, the, it, 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 we've got licensure. Right. Right. So, yeah, exactly. I think we have time. We're going to take a quick 15 minute break. We have one more comment here from Dr. Porter. So, I, having looked at it on both sides of the fence, uh, from a big healthcare system and being in private practice, the I think the appointment piece of it is something that I think needs to be looked at a lot closely, um, because even when I'm seeing patients in Montana, the reason I'm seeing patients in Montana is because the actual office. Uh, a couple of reasons. One is is that the office doesn't actually have enough appointment times. They still need providers. Um, and they just don't have enough appointment slots to meet the needs of the people that actually exist in that jurisdiction. Um, and so from a hospital system perspective, the hospital system is just, they're always looking for pay providers. There's never a shutoff valve in saying that I'm not hiring a doctor or a nurse practitioner or a PA. Whereas in private practice, you have to actually wait till you get to a certain point from a wait time to say, okay, now it's time to put the faucet on and go see, I need to go find another doctor or I need to. So the, the line that somebody is trying to look at on whether or not network adequacy should be changed one way or another, I think it varies based on the type of system that you work in. And just to, I guess, put it out there, I don't think that there needs to be an official legislative cap, so to speak, because I think that then determines, that makes that takes the power out of the patient's hand on how they want to be able to access the system if they so choose to. Uh, I'm much more in alignment with what you're saying and that let it be the provider's perspective or prerogative on how much telehealth do they want to offer if they have the capacity or even the knowledge or skill set to be able to do it. Great. Well, thank you for that comment and all those other uh, very insightful comments. We're going to take a 10-minute uh, break now, uh, and we'll resume at 3.15. So thank you.